For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. To support a future coming of Christ, we need to explain why Paul's message is not relevant to his first century audience, and why Paul's telling them the dead Christians 2,000 years or more in the future will not miss their reward at the coming of the Lord. But to do this is an exercise in absurdity. The living of Thessalonica are not asking Paul if the dead who will die for the next two millennia will miss out. They are asking Paul if they're dead, their first century relatives and brethren who they love will miss out. Paul then consoles them, assuring them that the dead will not miss out. We who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. By this we know unequivocally that the Thessalonians were not, they were, they were not expecting to be long dead before the coming of the Lord. It's obvious that they were expecting this, the, the, you know, the parousia, the second coming, soon. Hence their concern for their dead missing it and not themselves. This is the only way to make sense of Paul's consolation. We who are alive and remain shall not precede those who have passed away, you know, short of employing our own flavour of eyes of Jesus. Nowhere in the New Testament will you find the smallest hint that there's this far, far off fulfilment. Conversely, what you'll find is that every book of the New Testament unambiguously insists upon a first century fulfilment. To divorce this scripture from its context and insist Paul is saying something other than what he is literally communicating ought to play in your conscience. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here we read that the time of the resurrection and judgment is at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and his kingdom, and more. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That sews that up very nicely. Because you have taken your great power and reigned, the nations were angry and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, great and small, small and great, and should destroy those who who destroy the earth. When Jesus said, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works, assuredly I say to you there are some standing here who, who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He was literally, contextually, necessarily saying that the resurrection would happen in the first century. Assuredly I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Time and time again in hundreds of places the New Testament states that first century Christians would be around to see the fulfilment of what's being foretold. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Who is Paul telling a mystery and who shall be changed? Who is Paul writing to? Who were the recipients of this epistle? To whom then is this epistle relevant? What is Paul telling the congregation at Corinth? In Matthew 23, Jesus addresses the dead Jews who boast, saying, if we were around back in the days of the prophets, we would never have slain them. Jesus tells these people, that they shall be sent prophets, and by their own words they'll be convicted, because they shall slay the saints of God. And in fulfilment, Paul writes, who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they do not please God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they may be saved. 
so as always to fill up the measure of their sin, but wrath has come upon them to the uttermost, that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias and of Berechai, whom ye murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon, drum roll please, this generation. Here Jesus is stating that all the righteous blood of all the martyrs, even from the beginning of creation, would be vindicated within his generation. We must catch the power of these kind of statements because there's so many of them and to miss them is to miss the message. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Here we read, Jesus is ready to judge the living and the dead, and how the end of all things is at hand. This fits perfectly with how I read the words, we who are alive and remain. It's contextually sound and prophecy fulfilling. There is no justification to ignore the first century context of this and every reason to take it seriously. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Again, the first century audience of believers are told, the time has come for judgment to begin with the house of God. Peter is talking about the judgment, the end of all things. Jesus and Paul speak of its imminence and John tells his audience they're in the last hour. Nevertheless, I tell the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So the apostles, guided by the spirit of truth, informed their audiences that the fulfillment of all things was upon them, just as Jesus said. Paul, under the direction of the spirit of God, told the Thessalon Thessalonians, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. This was a trustworthy consolation given to the Thessalonian believers through Paul by the word of the Lord. Paul states unambiguously that this message is to you, the Church of Thessalonica.